extends across to our Will NZ um, colleagues most definitely. Um, so I will pop those in the chat, but Christina, I am handing over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Erin. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. I'm Christina Hoffner and um, I'm calling in today from Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And would like to talk with you a little bit about digital ethics and portfolios, because I think portfolios can play a very big role in will in general and uh, support students as well as uh, university staff members and also employers if it is for an internship and externship, for example, that students go on in recording learning evidence and also in following the students on their uh, learning journey. And that's why we are having this webinar today, uh, so that I can give you a little bit of an overview of um, portfolios in general, but in particular also then using examples um, from Mahara to show you how digital ethics can be implemented in a portfolio platform in order to keep uh, students as well as everybody else who is using the platform um, secure and safe and also acknowledge um, all the, the artifacts that are being placed in there and where they are coming from. And we'll look at those principles very shortly. As Erin mentioned, I'm happy to take uh, questions during the presentation itself um, or repeat something if you have problems uh, hearing. Um, I'll also be monitoring the chat, uh, but you'll also have time at the end of the session in order to um, go back to any questions that I might have missed. And besides the recording being made available, I'll also make the slides available so that you then have the links directly available in there. I work for Catalyst IT in Wellington, New Zealand, and we pretty much only work with open source solutions, uh, open source technologies, and are working across many, many different systems. And um, while we had been founded in Wellington in 1997, so already a little while ago, and have also offices in Auckland and Christchurch. We also have a very good presence in um, Australia, just across the pond, uh, where most of you are from, um, in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane, um, and also have offices in Brighton and Dublin, and are about to establish an office also in Canada. Um, while we work with lots and lots of different um, open source technologies for learning management systems, the library management systems, but also bespoke um, applications, my focus today is going to be on Mahara. Mahara is an open source e-portfolio platform that was founded in 2006 um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it was actually university project and or tertiary institution project in general, um, rather than coming from a software development company like us. We have been partnered with the project uh, from the start, um, but the idea really was not to create another software just for the software sake, um, instead really have a software available where the student is in the center. Because at that time, um, already many tertiary institutions had learning management systems. And as the term learning management system already says, um, there's a lot of management of learning and teaching going on. However, what was lacking in a lot of those systems at the time was the possibility for students to um, keep their learning. Um, to decide what they what they find is important of their learning journey. And at that time, personal learning environments were really on walk. And um, that was that one aspect that was missing from the LMSs. And therefore, Mahara was founded to be a complementary platform to learning management systems, where their focus was really on the learners. Um, because lecturers or tutors did not automatically then have access to portfolios, but a student needs to invite them in. The students also decide what of their learning they want to keep 
be that from formal learning or informal learning processes, um, and also with whom they want to share that. So very early on already, um, it is that privacy was a very important aspect um, in Mahada and who had access to what content and also what um, could be shared and how it could be shared. Over the years, of course, we've developed the platform further to keep it versatile and make it even more versatile to be used in many different platform spaces and uh, not sorry, not platform spaces, but um, educational contexts. And so that we can now use it for showcase portfolios and presentation portfolios where really the, the best skills are displayed and uh, the best evidence of learning. Um, to developmental and process oriented portfolios where students showcase how they go from A to N, what they have been learning through that time, um, as well as assessment portfolios, so that at the end students may get a grade. And hopefully these types of portfolios already give you a little bit of an idea of how portfolios in general could be used for real because showcasing skills and competencies is oftentimes an important aspect of work integrated learning, I find, as is showing the development over time, say during the course of an internship, and then also in some cases maybe have an assessment at the end of it. And um, while there are a lot of different uh, portfolio of reasons for keeping portfolios out there, for me, it goes, uh, comes down to a very um, concise definition on folio thinking, which explains very nicely um, how a portfolio differs from anything else that students might be doing, like blogging or just collecting their learning evidence. And that definition here from Vicky Suter is based on the work um, in particular by Helen Chen. Uh, she's a portfolio researcher at Stanford University. And so in Vicky's definition, she says, folio thinking is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection, and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories, about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. So let's unpack that briefly and focus on these words. So a portfolio is the collection, organization, reflection, and connection in order to tell a story, namely to tell our learning story. And because the learning experiences do not stand just next to each other and are finely separated, um, we want to relate those experiences to each other because learning happens all the time not just in the classroom, of course, and um, outside, but whatever we are doing, we are learning. And I find oftentimes we are reflecting just implicitly in our own mind, whereas with a portfolio, you have the possibility to make that learning and that reflection visible and therefore more explicit and um, be able to share it with others. And that is where those connections come in. And to boil this down kind of to five activities um, that in my mind are important in the portfolio creation process, we have uh, create, so create the learning evidence, do an activity, um, research a project, um, participate in, in an internship, um, bake a cake, um, work with a client on um, their motor skills, um, organize a bike race or anything that is part of um, the will activity. But not just create that learning evidence and but then also collect it. And that can be just collecting it all together, um, be that on a computer, on a smartphone or even physical evidence um, that might at some point be of interest to the portfolio. But the portfolio doesn't stop there um, because then we would only have an archive and we would need to sift through it. The really important aspect for me and very central aspect I find is the curation of that evidence. Um, so the organization as well as 
sense making, making connections between the learning evidence as well as the reflection of the learning experiences. Because through that, do we further our learning and can figure out whether we want to continue doing that thing or whether we want to make any changes. And since learning does not happen in isolation, we also have conversations in there. And conversations so that we engage with others in terms of getting feedback from them. And once we've received feedback, we might want to engage with them in a conversation um, and really bring other opinions into the portfolio, give other people the voice who can help in our learning process. And then there's also the possibility to connect with others on the platform because Mahara is not only and in this case, exemplary, exemplary and Mahara is not only a platform where you create your personal portfolios, but you can also engage in creating group portfolios, work with others together on a portfolio, um, share, share files, um, join in forum discussions, and really also have your own um, community of practice, for example, in order to talk things through. Now that's quite a bit of different activities in the portfolio and oftentimes um, we, we have been looking only at the content really from that learning perspective. Um, but there is also an element in there that we need to consider more and more when creating portfolios and that is the element of digital ethics. Because portfolio content can be made public or can be shared with others and other people's opinions are in, um, in the portfolio themselves and therefore we need to be mindful of other people and also of um, how we are engaging with them. And so over the last two years, ABLE, the Association of Authentic and um, exper Experiential and Experience-Based Learning, um, based in the United States, but with membership around the world, decided to put a, focus, a research focus on digital ethics um, because it became apparent that it was ever increasingly important to talk about that and also to prepare students as well as institutions um, for the topic. And so last year, the uh, Digital Ethics Task Force was formed um, around about in September, there was a conference in July where it was kind of formally announced and um, people could apply for the task force and then the work started really in September. Over. There are for this year 11 uh, task force members and the majority of them are from the United States, but there is also Christine Slade from the University of Queensland and myself were in there and looking at also the international perspective um, so that it is not just a publication that we are creating for the American market, but something that can also be used across um, the world. And so what we had been looking into over the last few months is principles for digital ethics. And there, of course, are tons of stuff that could fall into that. And so we actually had to confine ourselves to about a third of the, uh, the area that we wanted to cover and came up with 10 principles in this year one. There will be a follow on year um, starting again in September where other people can also join the task force. And so the principles that we came up with, and when you receive the slides, you can click on that image in order to go to the uh, uh, to the publication itself. And if we have time, I'll show it to you a little bit as well. So the 10 principles that we have um, are very much focused still on uh, kind of platforms as well as general awareness, general items. And that's why we know there are still other things that we might want to look into in the future, especially also things coming out of COVID um, and new foci that need to be taken into consideration. And so our 10 principles for this year are support, promoting of awareness, practicing, respecting author rights and reuse permissions, access to technology, privacy, content storage, pr 
cross-platform compatibility, accessibility, and also consent for data usage. And so these uh, 10 principles are all structured in the same way, namely that we have a summary, very briefly stating what it is about, then slightly longer statement in the abstract, um, strategies that can be employed either by students, faculty members, um, institutions in general, or also um, portfolio platform creators. Scenarios, illustrating some of the good practice that um, would be expected for this principle, and then resources. And um, we created a whole bunch of um, resources, or linked to a number of resources and wrote scenarios that fit the principles and um, other people are definitely invited to also contribute. Um, before I actually continue, I will share um, very briefly with you the um, the principles, just to give you a quick overview um, of what they look like. And so um, I also pop the link into the chat so you can explore it on your own. Um, so the principle is pretty much a very long text, but it can be explored nicely in chunks. So you can go and click on one principle itself and then are taking to that page, have the, the principle, the summary, the abstract, then also the strategies and scenarios, um, student scenario, teacher scenario, institution scenario, and also resources at the end. And there's also links to the other elements in the field, uh, in the digital ethics uh, principles document so that you can jump to different parts yourself. Now, the nice thing about the platform that we are using here, which is Scalar, is that you can also have visualizations in order to have different entry points into the document. And so in this case here, um, that is the path representation. And there you can see all the uh, principles themselves and explore them by going more deeply into it. And then you can directly click on what is interesting you. And that is a nice way to either see all the principles on one page, all the scenarios, or also all the glossary entries, rather than only having a linear text. And we are expecting to expand this um, document or this, this platform here um, more over time in order to um, add more resources, um, add links to, to them, and then also add further principles as they are being developed. The platform is already available right now for you to explore if you like. Now, um, we've kind of briefly looked at the, uh, the principles and um, that we, we have a number of them already developed during that first year. And I'd very much like to give you a quick overview over how, that, how summer principles could look like in action and what platforms that provide ePortfolio capabilities um, can do in order to follow those principles and in order also to implement them, make sure that they are being followed and that students' privacy is uh, taken care of as well as um, also accessibility and so on. And so to start with, kind of when you get into the platform itself, um, in Mahara we have cross-platform compatibility because you can view it on a desktop device, on a tablet, as well as on a mobile screen without losing any functionality that is important to look into. Um, one very central principle 
is also, and, and it took quite a time actually to come up with these concise 10 principles and we've merged things into a, um, from a much larger list of principles is of course privacy. And that can be exhibited in a lot of different ways. And even if you're not using Mahara or have never heard about it, think back to platforms that you're using and see how privacy is um, implemented there. Do you have the possibilities to decide with whom you want to share something? Do you or can you see with whom you have shared um, learning evidence or also um, other aspects of your portfolio or your work? Can you restrict that access? And Mahara, we can do so because um, every portfolio creator decides whether they want to share it with one particular person, another person, with a group of people, everybody who has access to the platform or the general public. And that is crucial because a portfolio is not always um, exactly one thing, um, but there are many different reasons why people create portfolios and therefore it should be left um, up to the student to decide with whom they want to share. Very related to that is of course also content storage, um, especially in times um, where some people sell content and then suddenly it is found elsewhere. It is vitally important, especially with sensitive content, um, that students know, again, who has access to their content and how they can remove that access as well. And then for an institution to also know where the portfolio content is stored um, and who has access to it. And kind of going from that theme on is also the consent for data usage. Um, does the platform that you have allow you to decide on terms and conditions? Um, is it locked into the platform or can it be exported? Does it respect the GDPR or similar um, privacy regulations? And is the content tracked or do you have control over how much tracking is happening on the, on the site? So if you're looking at um, readily available free sites that people can sign up for portfolio work, oftentimes they have advertisement. And if you look at how many connections there are outside of uh, going out to advertising platforms, it can be quite horrifying. And that means also that content from students might be able to be visible to those advertisers. And is that really something that an organization wants? And so on Mahara, it is very important for us that institutions have the full sovereignty over the content and decide for their platform who can access it, what the terms and conditions are, and then also that the data is not, not locked in, can be exported, and that of course privacy is a given. Um, no tracking is also available. Um, and you can decide if you want to um, track students for some basic web analytics. And accessibility is of course a very important uh, aspect as well. And um, there we are looking in particular into keyboard accessibility, contrast, support for metadata so that um, also screen readers and blind um, people and also those with um, yeah, other assistive devices can perceive the portfolio content. And right now in the team, we are working towards the WZAD 2.1 um, accessibility standards and looking what we might want to change or might need to change in order to support them. And last but not least, it's, it's kind of staying really in that um, privacy, transparency, and also reusability uh, context is the respect for author rights and reuse permissions. And there we have the possibility to um, determine the license that content has that is uploaded. Um, so that students can directly say under which license they want to publish their content um, or make available even if it is not publishing to the world. And also if they, um, if they showcase work from others that they can add a license to it. So that it is always very clear of what is happening. Now that was just a very quick 
look into some of the principles that um, we are already respecting Mahara to give you an idea of how these principles can be applied on a platform level. And I encourage you to look at your own platforms and see how they are doing that. If you feel like um, there, there should be a change in there or you'd like to talk with um, your provider and see if there is a need for making changes in order to make the platform more secure or more private for students to use and um, therefore give them a chance to keep their content secure as well as um, respect the digital rights of other people and follow digital ethics principles. And so altogether, I find there's a lot of sense making involved and taking closer look at um, the current practices at an institution in order to find out, well, is there something that we want to look into? Um, is there something that we, we can take from those principles that would be really useful for our organization to focus on? And of course, not all the um, all the principles focus on the technology. There's also a number of other principles that really look into working more on the pedagogical side, namely um, the support for portfolio work, then also looking into universal design um, contexts, and also um, in the future, hopefully going more into inclusivity as well and diversity and bringing some of those principles in. Right now, they, are, they have been kind of slightly mentioned, but not yet to the extent that they deserve, um, because at some point we needed to make a decision on what we were going to look at for the first year of the task force, and then therefore focused on a new set of um, principles that we have come up with at the moment. And so I really invite you to look at all those principles and see how they can apply in your context. And also if, they, if you have any questions for them, because while we try to write for an international audience, um, it can sometimes be quite tricky because um, in particular between the countries, there are just different terminologies that are being used. Uh, so if there's something where you feel like um, there's more explanation needed or another glossary entry for that matter should be introduced, then please do get in touch. And you can do that either um, via the task force email address that is um, given in the document or also get in touch directly with me. Or if you have any questions for the um, content of the presentation, then I'm also happy to answer questions. And that can be via email or and also be noted directly in the session. That's great. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, I'm looking forward to going in and, and having a look at those principles and, and being able to, to dive a bit deeper there. Um, I do um, want to be able to open open questions to to everyone. Uh, Andy, did you have any comments at all? No, I just really want to say a big thank you to Christina. I guess for many of us, uh, we're encouraging uh, e-portfolios or evidence-based portfolios uh, for our students. And uh, this is a great platform, um, which has obviously been um, developed and created over a number of years and added to. So um, no, thank you, Christina, for sharing the work that you've been doing over a number of years. And Christina's also had uh, a number of inputs to our Will NZ conference over the years. So um, it's uh, nice to hear from a friend. Thank you, Andy. Um, Tom, I see your question and you're raising a really, really valid one. Um, so you say principle five says, e-portfolio software should be accessible with institutional devices. And that, that is not much use for students unable to access uh, a campus. More important is that the tool doesn't require high-speed broadband. And I fully agree with you. And um, that was actually something that we did discuss um, just recently because we decided on the, uh, the main text uh, was written or was finished, we, we finished writing that um, I think kind of really end of, of March, beginning of April, and then went through a number of cycles of um, just uh, copy editing and the like. And at that time, while COVID had already been happening, 
the the focus was still very much on not so many not having all these um, online webinars, but still having physical access um, on campus. I have to remember it's especially from from an um, American audience coming, and um, there was a discussion. Well, should we add um, another principle? Should we revise our principles right now in order to take the new situation into consideration? And um, we decided to not make too many changes at the moment. Um, and I'm certain that there will be a number of adjustments or new principles being looked at as part of the pandemic. And um, it, the, the sentence can also be read slightly differently, uh, namely that it also needs to be accessible from devices on campus and not just relying on personal devices, um, because we can't expect that students all have their own equipment and have laptops or tablets and mobile phones available, but that they need to have the chance and need to have the possibility also create their portfolios on campus. So it is um, kind of a little bit ambiguously written there and, and can therefore mean a couple of different things. And yes, internet broadband and is definitely an important aspect as well as we have seen over the last few months that it should not require that, but that people can also work um, with lesser capabilities on their broadband. And for Mahara, I can say that we do have the possibility with there to actually also work completely offline uh, because we do have a mobile application that does not try to replicate the functionalities in Mahara, but tries to extend them um, so that you can do your evidence collection and reflection offline by collecting all things in the app. And then once you have internet access again, can then upload them into your portfolio area and include them in a portfolio. Thank you, Christina. Um, our university, University of Canberra, um, utilises Mahara, um, but I was unaware mm -hmm. of the, the application versions and, and whatnot, so thank you very much. Um, Andrew mm -hmm. does have a question there in the chat, um, which is more of a financial question. I'm not sure if you yep. can enter that on the spot. Um, Oh, I can certainly that answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Andrew, the, your, your question, just in case the, the chat doesn't come across in the recording, is that what is the charge for using Mahara? University budgets are very tight at the moment, as we all know. And um, that is a very good question. Uh, Mahara itself does not cost anything because it is an open source software that is released under the um, general public license and therefore anybody can download it and run with it doesn't have to pay anybody else and that can also mean that if your IT department is happy to host your Bahara instance they can install it they can put security updates on other minor point updates or upgrades and and then maintain it and a lot of universities around the world do that and that is certainly the majority of people using Mahara However, if you do not have those capabilities, those technical capabilities at your institution, then you can work with a Mahara partner such as us um, and have it professionally hosted and also maintained so that you don't have to worry about any of the technical capabilities and can focus on your portfolio implementation strategies and working with um, your students and staff and we can certainly also support you with that and give advice. Thank you, that, that's fabulous and I'm sure that that helps a lot of um, other people that might have had that, had that question as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to invite anyone if they wanted to um, uh, put their hand up or, or unmute their microphone if you wanted to, to say a comment or, or have a question for Christina. Tom makes a very good point um, that Mahara is oftentimes used alongside Moodle. Um, for, for the very long time, that had been a really ideal combination. Um, you can log into Moodle, jump automatically into Mahara, are logged in. There's also a plugin available that allows you to um, assess Mahara portfolios from within Moodle. And over the last few years, we have made um, 
enhancements to the platform so that you don't have to have a Moodle, but can use other learning management systems as well and connect to Mahara via LTI, the learning tools interoperability standard, which allows you to also perform that single sign on between the LMS and the portfolio, as well as um, assess portfolios directly from within the LMS, making it easier for lecturers to find their way. And um, then also, of course, keep the grade for the portfolio in the normal LMS gradebook. And yes, Erin, um, University of Canberra does have it with, uh, does have the connection with Canvas. And that just allows for a really smooth operation between those two platforms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have anyone putting their, their hand up. Um, so, um, although Julia has just come to yeah. ask about Blackboard. Yep. Uh, yes, it does work with Blackboard as well, Julia. And there also it is it comes down to the configuration of the LTI connection. Um, in the Mahara manual, um, we do have the uh, ins uh, the the instructions for connecting to uh, Moodle or Totra, uh, Blackboard, Canvas, and also. Um, Open OLAT, which is a platform that is used in particular in Austria and Switzerland, I believe. And uh, we we do not yet have the instructions for Desire to Learn Sprite um, but um, that might also come at some point in time. Great, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, before uh, we we do uh, close off for for the day, um, and, and Christina, if you wanted to uh, just look at any questions that are coming in there, I just wanted to to send another reminder. Um, I spoke about this at the start uh, of the webinar that next Friday our ACES critical conversations on project based will. Uh, so the link is is at the start of the chat to to be able to to come along to that. And then uh, on Friday, the 28th of August, we have the ASIM research conversations uh, for HDR and ECR researchers. So anyone that's new to researching in will, um, please do do come along to that. Um, so that that's all from from me as such. Um, there's one question there, um, mm -hmm. Christina. From Tom. And, yeah. yeah. So it's an e-portfolio academics will understand without having used it. That is, is a good, very, very good question, Tom, because um, I believe that it is always good when an academic does have their own portfolio or has started working with portfolio practices in order to understand what it takes to keep a portfolio. Uh, because it is not just an activity that you can slot in easily and then forget about. Um, portfolio pedagogy, in my mind, um, does require a shift in thinking of what sort of activities are given to students um, and make them more holistic and um, not focus on just individual tasks. But because we are looking at reflections of learning events and we are looking at um, connecting between learning um, evidence, between learning experiences, um, it comes pretty much naturally that it is more project related work or that students um, really need to think on their own rather than just go and go and take a quiz or do a quick assignment. And that it is oftentimes also not just once at the end of the semester, but kind of spaced out throughout the semester. Um, so that there can be portfolio tasks either once once a week, every other week, um, integrated with other activities, reflecting on activities the students have done and the like. And that does require quite a bit of rethinking. And um, therefore, I think it does help if academics have gone through that process themselves, have experienced it, because then they will also know what it takes to reflect on a very regular basis. Um, of course, it is not a prerequisite to work with portfolios, um, but I think it is oftentimes a very good basis. Yeah, so I just, it's Tom here. Um, is mm -hmm. the audio working? Yes, it is Tom. 
Oh, good. Um, I'm using the telephone because my internet connection doesn't work with um, this video conference <laughs> software well enough. Um, I just relayed an experience where we had nine tutors sitting around discussing how we were going to mark the Mahara ePortfolios for the project students at ANU. But there were only two of us who, have, who had ever actually used an ePortfolio um, as a student. And um, even there, it was still hard to grasp for the others to understand mm. how this was not like a normal assignment and that business of being yeah. something the student had to work on. And the students had very, very great difficulty in coming to terms with the whole process. So it, it, the, it helped to have the tool, but that was really the mm -hmm. tiny part of the problem. Yep, the tool is, is, is just one part of the equation and in particular with portfolios I find it is looking at the pedagogical side of things and that is where Kathy's comment is coming in really well because um, she had worked with instructional dis, uh, dis, uh, educational developers and um, who helped shape the, the paper and the activities within assisting her and that is where we can see that support is incredibly important for implementing portfolios. I don't want to make it out like saying that it is a lot more process that is involved. Um, at the first time or second time it most likely is quite a bit of more work um, because everything is new. It is not just the platform that is new, but also rethinking the activities and um, really looking at the pedagogical concept of what you want to achieve and making that shift in, in the pedagogy more than anything else. And whether you then use an electronic portfolio um, of one sort or another, in a way doesn't really matter so much um, because you still need all the underlying um, pedagogical ideas and scaffold student learning, um, give them some prompts at hand, especially in the beginning when they might not be used to or very comfortable uh, reflecting or giving each other feedback. That, that does take time to develop. Thank you so much. Um, we might uh we might close the, the session off there or at least 